So welcome uh, to the Education Records Conference. As she said, my name is Kendra Yates. Um, I am the Records Analyst Manager at the Utah State Archives. Records analysts, just in case you wonder what that strange term is, what we really do is we're customer service for records managers um, from any kind of governmental agency. So state, all local, city, special districts. Um, we answer your questions about records management. We provide training, that kind of thing. We'll even come to your agency to do so, and we don't charge anything for any of it. So that's kind of what we do. So today I'd like to just talk a little bit about your school's records and the impact that they can have. Education records can help people attain their educational goals. Uh, this was the case for me. I had a dream. <laughs> um, my dream was to go back to school. Uh, the year was 2009, and I had been very busy having and raising my three babies, who are now 16, 18, and 19. Um, but I really missed learning in a classroom. It was something I'd always enjoyed and kind of thought I would always go back to do. It was really intimidating to figure out how to get started, though. Uh, so I decided to go back to school and finish my degree. It had been 13 years since I had completed any college. That was at Snow College and Salt Lake Community College, which I call SLIC. Um, I had AP credit from high school, and that needed to be transferred. And I also needed financial aid and had no idea how to go about getting that. Uh, the thing I had going for me was a lot of drive. I was very motivated. And also, I knew what degrees I wanted, which I think is a huge hurdle that you go through in college anyway, right? I knew I wanted to be a librarian. Um, and so I knew I, I needed a Master of Library uh, in Science, in Information Sciences degree, and could get a bachelor's in anything I wanted, which for me was history. I'd never figured out what I could do with that, so I hadn't done that earlier. Uh, but now I knew. So those were, those were the things going for me. Um, getting started was a lot more work than I expected. It took two plus months uh, to get all the paperwork done. And it felt like by the time I started, I thought I should get some college credit for the work that it took <laughs> just to get enrolled in the right classes and financial aid and, you know, everything in all my ducks in a row. It just was so much work. Um, and it worked. I completed my bachelor's degree in May 2012 and my master's in 2013. Uh, but I couldn't have done it without the records managers at Cottonwood High School, Go Colts, uh, Snow College, yes, I'm a true Badger, Salt Lake Community College, and the University of Utah. So the records that you manage have a lot of value administratively. Student records do a lot. They document registration, payment, enrollment, schedules, attendance, grades, accomplishments, health issues, special needs, behavioral issues, discipline issues, right? Transfer to another school, graduation, um, and then are used afterwards to go to school, as I did, university, college, military schools, all kinds, and to apply for jobs. So they, they have an administrative value that can go on for quite some time. But school records also, not student, but school, they can have administrative or fiscal and or fiscal value. Uh, things like policy development and implementation, financial transactions, you guys know all of this, this is what you do, right? Um, curriculum, staff, and even maintaining your facility and who visits your school. So all of those kinds of things. Uh, so I have a question for you. Does the way that you manage your records impact the way that your school or institution runs? What do you guys think? Yeah, yeah uh, I see some nods, yes. So a study, this was by a couple of um, professionals in Nigeria, so I'm going to try not to kill their name here, but Ngozi Amachukwu and Nawachukwu Ololobi from Ignatius Ajiru University of Education in Nigeria uh, found that poor records management results in difficulties in administering development and supervision of educational systems. In fact, poor school records management and the lack of staff development with regards to the entire information cycle are responsible for a number of management and policy implementation problems in schools." Close quote. 
Um, on that cheerful note, we'll move on to another story. Um, student records can help people gain citizenship or even an identity. We had a patron come into the research center at the State Archives who needed her student records in order to prove her identity. She was not issued a birth certificate at birth. Uh, we were able to locate entries for her in some elementary school records, which she was able to use to obtain a delayed birth certificate from New Mexico. People often need school records uh, in order to become citizens. So uh, that process requires, among other things, uh, that they have lawful permanent residency for at least five years, or three if you qualify as a spouse of a US citizen. And so they have to prove continued perma permanent residency for that length of time. So school records can help with that. Um, another thing that education records can do is help people substantiate claims. So according to the US Department of Justice, the United States conducted nearly 200 atmospheric nuclear weapons development tests from 1945 to 1962. Essential to the nation's nuclear weapons development was uranium mining and processing. That's a pretty piece of uranium. It's not usually so shiny. Um, so that was carried out by tens of thousands of workers. But as we all know, uranium, well, it's radio radioactive, right? So following the end of testing in 1962, many of these workers filed class action lawsuits against the government, which were dismissed but then the government, by the appellate courts. But the government wanted to figure out a cheaper version, cheaper strategy for dealing with this, because if they had to go to court for every person that sued them, it could be very, very expensive. So what they decided to do is create this program called Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, which most people just refer to as downwinder claims. Um, and what it did is it, it actually it gives restitution money to people and an apology to people who either worked in the uranium mining, uranium industry, or lived in certain areas. So they had to be able to prove that they lived there or worked in that industry. So this is a map from their website. The yellow states are those involved in uranium industries. The blue counties are downwind counties, and the green ones are both, both in the uranium industry and downwind counties. And so you can see that Utah has quite a few counties in, in that section. Let's see, we've got Beaver, Garfield, Iron, Kane, Millard, Paiute, San Juan, Sevier, Washington, and Wayne. Uh, so records managers actually use school records to provide proof of residency. I spoke with a couple of them about their experiences. Scott Bassett from Millard County, who is pictured there on your right, and Allison Merchant from Sevier County School District. Uh, and she explained the process. She said, if the individual graduated from high school, there will be transcripts. But if they didn't graduate from that school, or they were younger than high school, um, then they rely on roll books to prove student enrollment, and that's what they're looking at right there. So they have to scroll through page by page. These are handwritten in cursive, right? Um, going way back to 1907. And they have to try and match the name that the person's giving them to the name that they would have been known by in class, right? So the teacher, you know how that is. If you go by a nickname, the teacher writes that down. So. So they work really hard to try and find those. And I said, why can't you do crowdsourcing indexing, which, um, and they're private records still, so they can't do that. But they have started digitizing the roll books. But like I said, they can't index them without having to read through. Uh, once they find the records, they make a copy, and then they have to certify that it's an original copy for authenticity. And they do that by stamping it and sealing it and also writing a letter stating this was an original record. So she, she said that it feels great to be able to help people um, find themselves or a parent or older sibling because if you can prove your, prove your sibling was going to school and maybe you were only three or four, that they'll still accept that. Um, and Scott Bassett also really enjoys doing this. He actually remembers 
the clouds, the fallout from the testing from when he was a child. And it's a small community, so he knows everybody that he's helping, um, whether it's for them or for a deceased uh, family member. So that is one fantastic thing that school records can do. So they have a legal value. They can prove residency or prove identity. They can verify claims and help people gain US citizenship. So another thing that education records can do uh, is help people conduct scholarly research. So we see this a lot at the State Archives. Uh, we had a patron named Susan Vogel, and usually I wouldn't use a name because we can't disclose patron uh, usage, but she gave me permission. She used school records to research and ultimately publish a book about a famous Mexican artist who was actually born in Utah. So see if you can figure out how he can be a Mexican artist. He was born in Utah. Um, so this is her story, and I'll try and use her words. Um, this is her book, Becoming Pablo O'Higgins, How an Anglo-American Artist from Utah Became a Mexican Muralist. It was published in 2010. So she said, Pablo O'Higgins was born Paul Higgins in Salt Lake City, Utah in 1904. I didn't learn about him until 1985 when I was visiting a bookstore in Mexico City. The question that instantly popped into my head was irresistible. How did a blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy from Salt Lake City, Utah, who went to my same high school, East High, become a well-known Mexican muralist who, according to the book at the bookstore that she was looking at, sacrificed his life for the cause of the worker? I did some basic research in Utah, and thanks to grant money from Utah Humanities, I headed back to Mexico City to interview his widow, Maria. It was a nightmare. We are both lawyers. <laughs> Uh, she denied every fact I had learned about Pablo and insisted on the question that, shall we say, an alternative version of the facts. And she said, maybe she did me a favor because that kind of made her want to go back and dig a little deeper and make sure she had her facts right so she could <laughs> prove that she was right. Um, as I researched, one big question I was exploring was what would compel a boy from an upper middle class family in Utah to fall so thoroughly in love with Mexico and dedicate himself to the cause of the Mexican worker? Fortunately, I had access to the Utah History Archives, including Pablo's school records, to try to solve the mystery. In the school records, I saw that O'Higgins missed a year of junior high and high school. A note on his transcript said that he attended school in San Diego, so someone kept good records for her. I went to San Diego where school records confirmed that. I also learned that his statement, so this is Pablo's statement, that he had studied in art school for a year or two was a stretch. Their records indicated he left after only a few weeks. I discovered that Pablo had spent most of his time in San Diego at a ranch his family owned near the Mexican border. This is one of his paintings. Uh, it was there that he made friends with the children of the Mexican uh, ranch hands and fell in love with the Mexican people. His East High School records revealed a lot more about him. I wondered if Pablo was like me, a rebel who hung out in the stairwells, she says, or a coolie who sat on the front stairs and whose photo was on multiple pages in the yearbook. Did Pablo skip class like I did or have good attendance? She also put in a note in there to say she attended lots of class in college, <laughs> graduated with a 4-0. Uh, <clears throat> anyway. Uh, his transcript showed that he did go to class and was a good student. Something else stood out, though. In his senior year, he only took two classes, Spanish class and art class, from Leconte Stewart. Leconte Stewart, I'm sorry. Someone that knows art is mad at me now. Uh, to me, that was like hitting gold. It confirmed that his time spent on his family's ranch in El Cajon had sparked a desire to learn Spanish, likely to further connect with the Mexicans he had met and hoped to meet. And I had a clue about early influences in his art. His San Diego high school records showed that he studied music, Spanish, and journalism. O'Higgins boldly traveled to Mexico alone at the age of 20 and became an assistant to Diego Rivera, working with him on three of his most important murals. Uh, Rivera said that if he had a son, he'd want him to be like O'Higgins. O'Higgins lived in Mexico for the rest of his life, gaining a reputation as an artist of the people who dedicated his life to the struggle of Mexico's workers. Susan Vogel concludes, ultimately, my access to the educational records of O'Higgins, coupled with interviews with people who knew him in Mexico and the US, 
led me to conclude that O'Higgins, like, like Mexico itself, after the 1910 to 1920 revolution, created a new identity. His wife, by the way, one of the reasons she was telling the story she was telling was because he was part of the Communist Party in Mexico, but this was after the McCarthy era of anti-communism in the United States. So there's probably a, a logical reason for him to, to downplay some of that part of his history. Um, so some reachers are not historians seeking to publish, but are individuals seeking to connect with past generations and their families. I hope you'll forgive me for sharing another personal story. My maternal grandfather's name is Thayer Clark Barris, although he changed his last name to Barrows because he was tired of getting teased about the name Barris. And I'll just let you figure out that one, how he was getting teased. But uh, So I called him Grandpa Barrows. When my mom was a baby, her dad was a high school music teacher. He had a hard time uh, getting an orchestra together because he had a lot of interested students, but very few of them actually owned their own instruments. And it was a really strange collection of instruments at that. And I know all of this because it is mentioned in the high school yearbook from that year. So there he is. What the yearbook does not reveal is that he and his family lived in barracks behind barbed wire fences. He was a teacher at Topaz High School, which was in the Japanese and American internment camp called Central Utah Relocation Center, but we all just call it Topaz, right? It's just outside of Delta, Utah. They lived in a barrack similar to the replica, which is pictured on your right here, the same kind that the Japanese American prisoners lived in. I took this photo in 2015 when I took my family to the museum, the Topaz Museum in Delta, and that's my daughter, Brooklyn. Uh, I didn't have any pictures without, <laughs> without her in them, so you get her in. Uh, I was standing with my back to the corner wall, so that's the full size of the room. Um, you'll notice that there is no bathroom. They all had to use communal bathrooms and washing facilities. And um, my mom learned to walk in a crib because my grandma didn't want her walking on the cement floors. Uh, she was the fourth child in the family, and the oldest one was six. So you can imagine all eight of them living, six of them, I can do math, six of them living in that room, um, and how noisy that would be. So my grandpa Barrows kept his high school yearbook, which was produced by the Topaz High School students. And there he is on the faculty page. But this school record has more value than just to me as a genealogical uh, record. More value to, the, to just the, the granddaughter of a faculty member. Uh, it documents in a unique way, and I quote, this is from the Topaz Museum's website, one of the, one of the worst violations of civil rights against citizens in the history of the United States. The government and the U.S. Army, falsely citing military necessity, locked up over 110,000 men, women, and children in 10 remote camps controlled by the War Relocation Authority and four male-only camps controlled by the Justice Department. These Americans were never convicted or even charged with any crime, yet were incarcerated for up to four years in prison camps surrounded by barbed wire and armed guards. So... As you look through the yearbook, which is, there's a digitized version of it online. Uh, I think USU has that. What is striking about this school record is its air of normalcy. Photos of student body officers, track meets, football players, science club experiments, social committees, dances. The students went to a lot of work to maintain as normal a life as possible, or at least to present one. As a historian, I would ask the question, why? I'm not gonna answer it here. I don't have time for that, but uh, just noticed that there is no barbed wire in any of the photos in this book. It's hard to even tell where they are from the photos. But what these teens were experiencing was not a normal American high school experience. This photo was taken of students at their high school building, which you can see was really grim. 
nothing like the ones they would have been in if they had been home in California. My grandfather said that they were treated like prisoners. One was even shot for not getting away from the fence when ordered to do so by a guard. And it turns out he was deaf. He was walking his dog. Couldn't hear the guards yelling at him to get away from the fence. Um, so what frustrated, what frustrated me was that my grandpa could not distinguish when I talked to him about this, he couldn't distinguish the difference between the Japanese Americans in the camp and the Japanese that we were at war with. No matter how loudly I told him <laughs> that they were American, not Japanese. I was 18 years old and, and thought I could convince him. So I've learned since then, right? As you can see from these photographs, he was not the only one that was confused. This was in California. The school song, written by the students and published in the yearbook, says, all hail Topaz High School, a torch that our paths will light. Our colors, the green and gold, shall symbolize our might. From far and wide we've gathered and made now into one. We'll cherish this, our alma mater, which will not go unsung. All hail Topaz High School, we'll leave thee with spirits fine, and hope we will prove to be ever worthy sons of thine. Our steps for long you've guided, and now without a fear, we're proud to leave as part of you, our alma mater dear. But on the senior will page, which is a page where seniors can will things to the lower classmen, uh, for example, Fred Hayashi leaves his love of sports writing to Henry McLemore, and a, a funny one, Yoshiko Ikeda wills herself to any tall, dark, and handsome man with a neat smile. Um, Shizui Higuchi, however, says she leaves her memories of Topaz High School with a shudder. The school yearbook adds a layer of complexity to this story that reminds us that things were complicated and confusing 75 years ago, just like they are today. Uh, <clears throat> the Topaz Museum website states that the events and causes of this tragic page in history must never be forgotten. If we can understand what occurred and why, we can ensure that a similar denial of civil rights will never happen to any future generation of Americans, close quote. And I hope that that's true. I could go on and on about this subject, but I will try to restrain myself and stay on topic and just quickly mention that as I was thinking about those students, I began to wonder what happened to their regular school records. It only existed, the camp only existed for three years. So what happened to their enrollment records and their transcripts? So I contacted Millard County High School, or school districts, excuse me, and spoke with Scott Bassett. And he said, well, he's currently the curriculum director He's been with the district for 33 years and is also on the Topaz Museum Board, so he was the right person to talk to. He said that the Topaz High School was not part of Millard County School District, uh, but they were overseen to some extent by the State Board of Education, or what it would have been called then. Um, but also, after doing a little digging, he told me that actually it's the federal government, the War Relocation Authority, that worked with the state to oversee the school and that students wanting their records have to go through the National Archives to get them. So the museum does have a few copies of diplomas that were donated to them by former students, but they don't have any transcripts. So some of the records that you manage have historic value, and if preserved, can be used to conduct scholarly research, research connect with family, build community and identity, and provide insight and context for historical events. This is what you do when you care for education records. You enable dreamers, citizens, victims, survivors, researchers, seekers, and builders. You just never know how far reaching the impact can be. We are grateful to you for the hard work that you do to manage your records. And please let us know what we can do to help, anything we can do to help. And that's our contact information, thank you. <clears throat>